Welcome to Close Up Radio, where our hosts, Doug Llewellyn and Jim Masters, engage today's top thinkers from around the world to bring you information, inspiration, and thought-provoking ideas you can put to use in your personal and professional life right now. Covering a broad range of topics, Close Up Radio digs deep to discover what makes today's top thinkers tick. Close Up Radio, where ideas matter. And now, here's today's host, Jim Masters. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody, listening live from all around the world. We appreciate you being with us today here on Close Up Radio. Very excited also to welcome back one of our terrific featured guests, Frederick Fisher of Fisher Consulting Group. He's a professional liability specialist, risk management consultant, and the founder of Fisher Consulting Group, where he provides specialty lines of insurance-related consulting services, including expert witness services, litigation strategies, and support and claim prevention. Really fascinating work, and we're very excited to welcome him back to Close Up Radio for the next 30 minutes for this exclusive conversation. Frederick, welcome back to Close Up Radio. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Well, thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be back again. Uh, there's a lot to go over today, so I hope we'll jump right into it. But uh, it is a pleasure to be uh, welcomed back. Tell us what you do. What is Fisher Consulting? And tell us about some of the incredible work that uh, you're engaged in daily. Well, uh, primarily, now that I'm semi-retired uh, from the insurance industry, I, I uh, specialized in what's called specialty lines insurance, which is that area of commercial insurance that deals with director and officer liability, employment practice liability for sexual harassment and, term- and discrimination cases, fiduciary liability, which deals with employee benefit programs that uh, corporations put together for their employees, uh, as well as professional liability of all kinds. I had 20 years of experience in claims where I owned a claims TPA and we handled professional liability claims for insurance companies. And then I, I jumped to the uh, brokerage side and, uh, to provide that coverage because it is very, very complicated coverage, very dangerous. It is uh, not standardized. And you have to be really at the top of your game um, if you're you know, focused on coverage versus you know, just making money. Uh, now that I'm semi-retired from that, um, there are attorneys out there that believe I have something of uh, some specialty knowledge, and they hire me as an expert witness. Uh, and I do both plaintiff side and defense side, uh, pretty pretty equally actually. And I testify regularly as an expert witness on cases against insurance agents and brokers, or um, you know corporate issues involving uh, specialty line coverages. Uh, what have you. And uh, while I'm not allowed to interpret coverage, I certainly have a lot of knowledge as to the evolution of policies and and why they have evolved the way they have. And we also do uh, quality control review. Uh, we do have some corporate clients that uh, want us to look over their specialty line policies and point out what I call gotchas and how to hopefully cure them and fix them so that the financial protection being promised is, in fact, being provided. So that's, in essence, what what Fisher Consulting does today. That is terrific. You know, there's a lot of people out there that do all kinds of different work. What do you think it is that makes you unique from any competitors out there, Frederick? Well, if you're talking about being providing expert witness services, uh, what probably makes me uh, unique is the fact that not everybody takes cases they agree with. Um, there are some experts that will take a case just to take a case. I only take cases I believe in and I take uh, and that I uh, believe I, where I can be of true assistance. And you'd be surprised how often I turn down a case because I can't, or I don't agree with the position being taken. That's number one. But with respect to when I was a, a, an insurance broker. We were focused on providing financial security to our customer. That was what, that's what we sold as insurance. Insurance is probably one of the most intangible products out there that you can, anyone can buy other than perhaps Bitcoin because you don't know whether you've purchased the right policy until you submit a claim. And that is not a time when you uh, want to have a surprise. It's not covered for any number of reasons. Um, so that's we were focused on that. We were focused on providing financial security. We let our competitors sell insurance. They want to sell insurance to make money. We provided financial security, and making money then became a result of that. 
And I think that's a significant difference. Um, you know, people don't buy what you, what you do. They buy why you do it. And our why, our corporate mantra was we provide financial security, and we will do our best to do it. And if we can't, we'll tell you. We'll tell you what we think is wrong with the policy form or what kind of gotchas uh, exist that uh, shouldn't exist, but for whatever reason, the insurance company doesn't want to cure them. And that's what we did, and we did them regularly. And I think part of it, too, was the 20 years of claim experience I had where you know, the policy uh, on a particular file or on a particular claim that had been submitted never left my desk because every time you investigate more and you get more facts, then you have to look and see whether or not there's a policy provision that may be affected. So you get used to reading policies day in and day out and then applying them to the facts of a case. And so either the policy is correct and, and will provide the coverage or it's not. Or maybe it's the wrong policy, but unfortunately the insured didn't buy the right one. So, you know, uh, what can I tell you? But that's, I think, what really was unique uh, at the time as a broker, that we were that focused on uh, financial security and not just selling somebody some insurance. Right, exactly, yes. That's, that's a really good way to look at it, and that does make, those things do make you stand out. You know, I see that they're saying that they're experts, but that's not necessarily what they're selling. I mean, not a product, uh, not the transaction. Tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, my goodness gracious. I could go on for hours. Uh, you wouldn't believe sure. some of the advertising <laughs> that you see from from wholesale insurance brokers, retail insurance brokers, heck, even some of the medium-sized or larger-sized uh, local insurance brokers have these boilerplate uh, presentations they make when they quote an account for uh, a, a, one of their customers, whether it's new business or, or renewal they still have these elaborate presentations and they, they make all these promises about how we're going to learn everything about your business and we're going to tailor a program specific to your needs and on and on and on, and then they don't do it. They don't deliver it. I'm an, I, I'm an expert witness in a case right now where, believe it or not, the, the broker involved in that case flat out said in his deposition, that's not my job. Here's what I do. And yet it's all in writing to his customer in this, this presentation package. And it's you know it's like are you, do you really get what you're saying here? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. pretty sad. But unfortunately, I think um, just selling insurance is not the job. Providing financial security is. But what we've seen, and 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 I don't want to paint a broad stroke here, but a lot of it is dictated by private equity companies and, and hedge funds that are buying insurance companies or they're providing the financing to a company that wants to grow through acquisition. And the model now is to flip in one to three years, not five to ten. And so, you know, if you don't get the organic growth, uh, uh, you want to grow or have a 20% return on investment. If you can't do it organically, you're going to cut costs internally. And one of the ways they've done that is nobody's doing any training anymore. And so more and more what you're seeing as brokers is they're just salesmen. They could be selling vacuum cleaners door to door. The hedge fund or the private equity company behind the uh, acquisition investment isn't going to care. They just want 20% return on, equi- uh, on uh, investment. They don't care if you're selling vacuum cleaners or selling insurance. And so the salesmen are out there selling, 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 and they don't even know what they're selling. Especially when yeah. you're dealing with, you know, uh, the you know the old days of insurance, or you know, when I first got in this business in the 1970s, and everybody's watching, you know, Father Knows Best, and you know what have you, Donna Reed Show, um, and everything's wonderful, right? Um, in those days, a, a company could get along very nicely on a commercial liability policy to cover them for slip and falls and what have you, a commercial property package, you know, for their their first, you know, their property and, and, and real estate. They might get an umbrella kind of policy that, you know, is a little bit broader and access, an excess policy for liability and what have you. And they have to have a workers' comp. And then they have to, uh, but they may have a medical plan uh, for everybody. And that was about it. And life was simple and, and fine. And everything was standardized and what have you. Since then, however, it's gotten much, much, much more complicated. Number one, you've got a manufacturing economy that's evolved into a service-based economy. So you've got lots of people providing a service to someone else 
for a fee, whether it's a computer consulting firm or an internet consulting firm or a website consulting firm, and then you got people, uh, corporations now, there, the officers and directors want to have director and officer liability insurance. They have to worry about wrongful termination suits and discrimination suits that didn't exist in the 1950s. They have to worry about cyber liability that they didn't have to worry about even as late as the 1990s, uh, you know, and on and on. So now the number of policies that a business needs to purchase is no longer five. It's more like 15 or 20. And I've even seen what they're, oh, in these presentation packages, as I mentioned earlier, a list of additional coverages you might want to consider as long as 25 other perils and hazards you need to worry about, like internal theft or sure or external theft and crime by internal people or external, you know, somebody outside of your business committing a crime. And social media frauds where somebody says uh, acts like the president of the company on a business trip and wire $150,000 to this person right now, and it turns out it's a phony email, and people fall for that. Um, so it's gotten much more complicated. But the number of people that truly, number one, are experts and understand the coverage and understand the nuances, together with the gotchas that exist, are few and far between. And even if they do have that expertise, the lawyers are telling them, oh, don't advise your client. The standard of care for an insurance broker or agent is not. You have no duty to advise. So you, if you get sued and you don't advise, you can win that lawsuit. Well, what do you think is better? Giving the advice, letting your client make informed decisions, and, and getting the product correct, that they need correctly so that the product responds when they need it, or winning a lawsuit. I'd rather not have a lawsuit at all, and the only way to do that is to deliver the expertise that you have. And yet, lawyers are telling insurance agents, don't advise. That way you can win a lawsuit you know, if they sue you. Well... I'd rather not have a lawsuit at all, especially when most insurance agents and brokers do have the, the knowledge. They, they do understand the product. They may not be completely up to speed on a lot of the gotchas, but there's been enough written about them, including you know, articles and publications I've written myself, let alone many others. I'm not the only one, frankly, to be honest. Uh, that, that's important, and that's what they're not doing. And I think that's part of the problem. And you're seeing it every single day. Yeah. Mm. That's really amazing. It really, really is. So, you know, these the gotchas of talking about gotchas, even though you're not required to tell people what the gotchas are, you do because you really care about your clients and that makes a world of difference. Oh, I don't I don't think there's any question about that and I'll give you a good example of it. Um most policies in the specialty lines area are written on what's called a claims made basis. In other words, the policy has to be enforced when the claim by a third party is made against you. As opposed to your auto insurance, for instance, where that's written on an occurrence basis, i.e., the, the date of the accident, the day you run, uh, ran the red light and hit somebody or what have you. Um, that the policy has to be enforced when the accident takes place. But that's not true in specialty lines because a, a lawyer might make a mistake drafting your will. But there's been no damage. Nobody knows that he made a mistake. They're not going to discover that mistake until you, you die. And that could be, unfortunately, today or it could be 10 years from now or even 20. And then they discover, oh, you screwed up a generation skip tax issue or what have you. Uh, and so now you make that claim. So who wants to have to dig back 20 years to find the policy that was enforced on the day you made that error? So that's one of the reasons why claims made policies were developed, as they're more concerned about when the, the injured party makes the claim against you which, again, becomes very complicated because maybe you as a policyholder knew you made that mistake when you applied for the policy. So that's going to violate a warranty on the application that says, I'm not aware that I made any mistakes kind of thing. But that said, it gets even more complicated, and I'll give you a good example. Today, claims-made policies are written on a claims-made basis. It requires the claim be first made against you during the policy term. But another condition in the policy as well is that you tell the insurance company that a claim has been made, and you have to do that promptly. And there may be time limits as to how long you even have to tell the insurance company that somebody has served you with a lawsuit or what have you, because you'd be surprised how many times it is not reported in a timely manner. The problem is this. What's the definition of a claim? Mm -hmm. One of the most common definitions of a claim is a lawsuit, a written demand letter, 
or even the commencement of an administrative proceeding. Maybe the Department of Insurance has got a, co- a complaint filed with them, or the Department of Real Estate, what have you. But if the policy is a claims made and reported basis, let's go back to that definition of claim. A lawsuit, a written demand letter, or commencement of an administrative proceeding. Now, one of those definitions of claim requires the insured know about it. Now, one of those definitions says received by the insured. So how do you report something to the insurance company in a timely manner when you don't even know about it? And those requirements are being upheld by the courts. So what you really want in, in, uh, in a claims-made policy is you want one that says a claim will be de- deemed first made when any of the above is first, you know, first served on you. Or maybe you want a definition that says a lawsuit served on an insured, a written demand letter received by an insured, the commencement of an administrative action where notice has been provided to the insured. You need to have that language. And those are the kind of subtle gotchas that exist throughout the policies. And to make matters worse, now more and more policies have what's called absolute exclusions in them. And I've written four articles on it, including a massive uh, 28 or 30-page article for the International Risk Management Institute, which happens to be available on my website. But, um, you know, it goes over 30 decisions all over the United States enforcing absolute exclusions. And a good example of that is an insurance broker has buys malpractice insurance, just like a lawyer does or a doctor, and maybe they sell a corporation a, an employment practice policy. Now, most exclusions in an insurance policy exist because there's another policy to cover that item. For instance, every liability policy in the world, other than a workers' comp policy, excludes from coverage claims that would normally be covered by workers' comp. And why? Well, if you're you need to worry about employee injuries, you buy a workers' comp policy, like the state law mostly requires in almost every state. Buy that policy. So numerous exclusions exist because there's another policy to cover it. But what if the exclusion says, we don't cover any claim arising directly or indirectly from any discrimination, wrongful termination, or harassment committed by an insured? That's in a malpractice policy for an insurance broker. I don't have a problem with it. Because all it's saying is, this is an E&O policy for your professional errors. If you want to be covered for employment practice, buy an employment practice policy. But on the other hand, more and more exclusions don't refer to the insured. It doesn't say we don't cover any act, uh, act of discrimination committed by an insured. It simply says we don't cover any claim arising from any discrimination, harassment, or wrongful termination, period. Mm. So now that exclusion basically will apply where an insurance broker sells a corporation, sells a customer, an employment practice policy, something goes wrong with it, the corporation gets, uh, it finds out it's not covered for some reason, and they want to make an E&O claim, a malpractice case against their insurance broker. Guess what? Under that language in the policy, the insurance broker is not covered because the claim arises indirectly from an employment practice claim against the insurance broker's customer. Insurance broker had nothing to do with creating that that underlying loss, the, the, the harassment or discrimination. Yet the exclusion doesn't isn't limited to the insured's action, and these these claims are being upheld all over the United States. And worse, I mean, you look at some of these policies for insurance brokers, for instance, they may have 25 or 30 such exclusions in the policy where they're not covered for selling employment practice policies, they're not selling, covered for selling a D&O policy if there's an SEC issue, they're not covered for uh, selling somebody an environmental liability policy because of an absolute pollution exclusion, et cetera, on others, and so forth. Those are the problems. And I, I'm really beginning to think it's, it, it's actually part of an agenda to protect the supplier from any claims brought by consumers. And you're seeing that attitude not only in the insurance, but everywhere else. It's really fascinating. It really, really is. Um, You know, all of this, was this always your philosophy? How did you arrive at all of this? I mean, is it really about the integrity and the ethics that are paramount? I think it is about integrity and ethics. I think it's also a lack of education and a lack of understanding of, of what you're selling today. And, of course, you've got courts that also uh, are more more and more broadly interpreting ex- these exclusions. And in one appellate case uh, on, on dealing with an absolute exclusion, 
even the, the appellate court, at having to follow precedent to enforce an exclusion, referred to it as being, and I'm no, not kidding, staggeringly broad. That was the exact phrase from the, from the judge, uh, the appellate court. Staggeringly broad. What a statement that is. And what I don't understand even beyond that is why the Departments of Insurance are allowing this to happen. Or it, it may be something that may have to be cured legislatively, but when you have so much bribery going on, you know, oh, that's right, uh, freedom of speech, money-wise, um, you know, you, you, it may not happen. I, I really don't know. How did I arrive at this, uh, too? Um, it's always been my philosophy to provide financial protection. That's what insurance is all about. I actually believe in the insurance industry, honest to goodness, I do. But... You know, when you have this kind of language going on and you have this indifference going on, um, that, that is a big concern. But, yeah, it's always been my philosophy. Even when I was in claims, I always believed in doing the right thing. That really boils down to that. What did you do prior to Fisher Consulting? Uh, you mentioned that, you know, you've been in claims for a long time. Pregnant. Well, Number one, uh, the first 20 years of my career, I was involved in professional liability claims, which, you know, I just loved. It was fun. You learned an awful lot because you never knew what you are going to be dealing with. I mean, when you, when you get uh, a new claim in against an insurance broker, you could be dealing with anything from a failure to procure, you know, somebody's auto insurance or a failure to pr- properly insure somebody's offshore oil rig and everything in between. So it, it got really interesting very quickly because you got – you got to see all sorts of different types of underlying matters. And the same with lawyers' claims. Uh, you know, a, a lawyer that blew a statute of limitations and failing to file a lawsuit on a timely basis involving a car accident, okay, that's you know not complicated. But when you get involved in a lawyer that's involved in something that later turned out to be some sort of scam that he really knew nothing about, and suddenly realizes he has client is, is a con artist. That's a whole other matter. <laughs> so that that gets interesting quickly, and the interesting aspect of it gets addicting. So I loved handing claims, but you know the industry changed dramatically uh, in the way they used independent adjusters. So at one point, I decided maybe it's better that I jump to the supply side, and that's when I opened up an insurance brokerage focused on uh, what was called a wholesale model. But I had a lot of expertise in the uh, about professional liability, and I felt that I could better service my clients than my competitor, who was only interested in selling insurance. Right, exactly. You've got a heart, Frederick Fisher. You've got a heart, <laughs> and that matters. People are looking for that. They're looking to get through all the smoke and mirrors and all the the stuff that's out there. Uh, why doesn't everyone do it the way you do it? I don't know. I think it's a question that they don't even realize what they're supposed to be doing. There is such production pressure today, not just you know in the insurance industry. You're seeing it everywhere, and uh, that's part of it. And then a lot of people aren't even trained. You know, like I say, they're not even trained properly, notwithstanding you know continuing education requirements. But you'd be surprised how easy it is to get your 26 hours of continuing education requirements done in an afternoon. On a doing doing an open book exam uh, online, and you just turn to the page that deals with the question, and and you're done. So you know people aren't interested in learning anymore; they're interested in making money, and it's really kind of sad because you know making money should be a result of what you do; it should not be the focus. You're gonna make if you do it right, you're gonna make money. If you do yeah. it wrong, you're gonna make money, and you're gonna get sued. <laughs> you know, but I, I really I, I have no answer for why not everybody does it the way I do. And and I and believe me, I'm not the only one. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of other professionals out there that uh, that think like I do and try and do the the best and right thing. And certainly, I've got former employees of mine and and people I know in the industry that call me all the time, asking me questions about this policy or that. What do I think? So I'm not going to sit here and say I'm the only one because it's not true. But there are so a lot of people out there that you know do not know what they're doing and claim they do. And you know, a good salesman builds trust with the customer. But you're not. But you know, the customer now trusts you, but they don't know whether you're competent or not. It's just like the relationship manager for many investment advisors, the guy that pats you on the back and and comes to visit you twice or three times a year, and make sure you're happy with you know the investment plan and and the way they're managing your assets and money. You know, is not the guy doing the trading. The trading. He's not the guy doing the work. He's the guy that's out there keeping you happy. Exactly right. Yes, 
That's really, it's amazing. You know, I love what you do and the way you present it. It's really interesting, Fred, because is there anything worse than finding out that your insurance policy doesn't cover the one thing you needed it for? I mean, you hear these stories all the time. People feel betrayed and violated, and, you know, you've been paying for this policy under the auspices that it's going to help you when that worst-case scenario happens, and when it does, it's not there for you. Um, depending on the coverage you're talking about, that is certainly true, especially in commercial lines. Uh, it's not always accurate, however, because, you know, believe me, I, I've seen situations where, you know, a policyholder says, I wanted my broker, I told my broker I wanted to be covered for everything. I told my broker I wanted the best policy. Well, that's a little bit too broad. And I don't have much sympathy for that. What do you mean by best policy? Are you talking about price? Or are you talking about coverage? Are you talking about you know, any number or specific things you're worried about? Uh, so you have to be a little more specific than that. I don't expect any policyholder, even commercial ones, even with corporations that even have insurance risk management departments, to know everything about everything about what they need. They need to, to deal with experts who really understand the coverage and are willing to share that expertise. That's what's really necessary. Um, in, in personal lines, uh, you know, too, you know, you, you have a lot of people out there with unrealistic expectations. I don't want to spend more than eleven hundred dollars a year to cover my house. But what they re- don't realize is that to keep the premium down to that level, they're going to be giving up something somewhere else, and then they'll deny. Oh, he never told me that. He never said I'm underinsured for my my personal property, or I'm underinsured for my jewelry because it has. You know, they haven't taken the time to get it appraised and scheduled. You know that sort of thing. So you run into that a lot. Um, part, you know, so I'm not. I can't pay a broad brush that it's always the professional's fault for not doing the job. Sometimes they've got customers that are very difficult to deal with, and that is certainly true in the commercial world as well. Mm-hmm. I tell you, really, it's fantastic what, the way you present this. Um, we don't have a lot of time left. We've got like a minute and a half here, but the expert witness work that you're doing. Um, Tell us a little bit about it and how you got involved in its unique work. Well, I got involved with it 30 years ago because of somebody who used to work for me was a practicing lawyer, and he had a case involving a real estate broker that he wanted me to be involved in because I had just published a book on real estate malpractice. So he figured I might be able to be a credible expert, and it worked out that way. And I kind of thought it was fun, and I thought – you know, long term that, you know, someday I might actually retire from the business and maybe I'll just find a way of doing this kind of work part time. And so that's how that thinking started. And then word gets out. I mean, lawyers talk to each other. Who did you use for this? Who do you use for that? Are they good? Do they know what they're talking about? On top of it, by the time I started doing a fair amount of uh, extra witness work, I'd already published 50 or 60 articles in uh, well-known insurance industry publications as well as uh, being somewhat high-profile in speeches and, and uh, webinars, uh, ultimately, and, and talks on how to prevent claims. And I was also heavily involved in an organization called the Professional Liability Underwriting Society and served on the board uh, of that for uh, six years, as well as ultimately being pres- president of the organization in 1998. So I was somewhat highly profiled in my industry, and people certainly knew who I was. And that's that's kind of how it happened. And, uh, oh, you know, some people actually think I'm a good expert, N- not just because of the knowledge, but yeah. how I testify. And that's exactly. the, the key. I mean, that's, that's, I try and, you know, I, I don't want to come across arrogant. I don't want to come across, you know, like, oh, yeah, the sound of your expert, and you'll listen to everything I have to say. And, you know, apparently some people seem to think I can take complex concepts and, and present them in a way that people can understand and that yet not appear arrogant. And I think that's why it works. Balance, absolutely. And you do it expertly, my friend. Really a pleasure to have you here, Frederick Fisher of Fisher Consulting Group. The website, folks, is www.fisher, that's F I S H E R, and then cg.com, fishercg.com. Thanks for joining us, uh, Fred. This was really a pleasure having you back on the show and looking forward to hopefully chatting more down the line. Well, thank you, Jim. It's always a pleasure, and thank you for inviting me to, to present today. 
You're very, very welcome. Keep up the amazing work that you're doing. Again, it's impacting lives in such a positive way, and I know you love every second of it as well. Gang, go to www.fishercg.com to connect with Frederick Fisher. Jim Masters here thanking you for your time this time to next time on Close Up Radio. Stay tuned. I'll be right back with another amazing guest to celebrate as well. Till then, for all of us, have a terrific day. Thanks for listening, and bye for now. <laughs>